Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about building partition walls and adding arches, and we'd like to thank Scott Polishay for liking and sharing the podcast. For most projects, if you're building a partition wall, you're going to be using 2 by 4s That's not really the size. Yeah, it's weird. In the 1800s, though, most lumber was actually pretty close to the size that it was called, but it varied around the country depending on your local sawmill. The first nominal standard was adopted in 1924 just to make it easier to build with uniform lumber. Around 1900, the most common size for joists, rafters, and studs was 2 inches, and it wasn't until 1961 that the standard size for nominal lumber was set for 1 inch nominal, the actual size was three quarters of an inch, and for two inch nominal, the actual size was an inch and a half. What does that mean? So nominal means just in name only. So nominal two by fours are actually one and a half inches by three and a half inches. So they take this rough sawn log, roughly two inches by four inches, they trim it down, they dry it, and then it finally gets to the actual size of an inch and a half by three and a half inches. Hmm. Is it just lumber? Does anything else come in nominal sizes? There are some things like tile. Some ceramic and stone tiles can come in nominal sizes. So you could have tiles that are actually 12 inches by 12 inches, for example. Or it could be a nominal 12 by 12, which could actually be like 11 and 7 eighths by 11 and 7 eighths or some other size. Hmm. <laughs> Crazy. Huh? Mm-hmm. In the U.S., we call 2 by 4s or 2 by 6s and other cut sizes of wood lumber. Most other countries call it timber. And we call timber trees that are cut down or landscape logs. Is that why you yell timber? You know, I was reading a forestry blog about the origin of yelling timber when cutting down a tree. And one of the responses was it's more effective than yelling fish. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) For framing partition walls with 2 by 4s you're going to be using 16 penny nails. doesn't say penny though, does it? No, it's going to say 16D on the box. Which, of course, makes no sense. Right. (laughs) You'll see common sinker and box nails that are called 16D. The 16D common is going to give you the best holding power. They're three and a half inches long. 16D sinkers, they're three and a quarter inches long, and they're slightly thinner. And the head is textured, and that helps keep the hammer from sliding off. And the head also has a taper to help it sink into the wood. And most of these are going to be coated either to help it slide into the wood easier or it's going to be coated with an adhesive for better holding power. The 16D box nails are even thinner than the sinkers. They're three and a half inches long, but they're not going to have the strength of a common nail. And these were originally made to hold together boxes. So they had these thin slats of wood for boxes. And rather than it splitting the wood with a common nail, they made these thin box nails so it wouldn't split the wood. Exciting. So for framing, if you're toenailing your studs in place and you're using two nails per stud, let's say on the top or the bottom, generally you're going to be using common or sinkers. If you're using three nails while you're toenailing, then you would be using a 16D sinker or box nails, but I would check my local code. Okay. What about using screws? You wouldn't want to use drywall screws for framing. They aren't strong enough. There are some specialty framing screws, three inches long, that you can use an impact driver with. But 16 penny common or sinker nails are easy to use. And this is a good project to learn how to swing a hammer and drive nails. What type of hammer should you be using? So if you're thinking about purchasing a hammer, a claw hammer around 16 ounces with a smooth face is going to be the most versatile for homeowners. It's good for a lot of projects. A framing hammer that's 20 ounces or heavier with a long handle, it's going to drive 16 penny nails very easily, but it's harder to control if you don't have a lot of experience. Okay. What's the point of a partition wall? Are we ever going to talk about that, by the way? When I was investing in real estate, we worked with the Section 8 program, and the rent of the home was based on the amount of bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So I became great at building partition walls to create bedrooms and closets. We would take these old homes with unfinished attics or open floor plans and build walls to create bedrooms. And if you're thinking about having rental homes and working with Section 8, I wrote a book that's called How to Pass the Section 8 Inspection. 
and you can check that out on Amazon. <laughs> Was that too blatant of a pitch? Yes. For the book. <laughs> it's an ebook, by the way. You still haven't answered my question about partition walls. So if you have a home with a large open attic or a second floor, you can divide up the space and make rooms pretty easily. You can finish a basement with partition walls. You can build partial partition walls or room dividers, and that can break up large open areas. Mm -hmm. In my mom's condo, there's a partial wall with open shelving on the top half, and that separates the living room and the dining room. The bottom half, it's solid, so she can put a chair against it for the living room and then still have that open feel and storage on the top part. In bedrooms, you can build partition walls to create a closet. Or in a bedroom, you can build a partition wall around a Murphy bed and kind of create a multi-purpose room. Hmm. If you have a large living room, you can also create nooks for audio equipment or built-in shelving. Right. You seem kind of excited about the Murphy bed. You want to explain what that is? Yeah, they're cool. They're a, a bed that folds up into a wall or a cabinet. Outrageous. And, and, <laughs> and there's a lot of interesting wall bed systems. You can buy the whole unit. There's a couple top-rated company. One is Closet Works, and the other is the Better Way Company, mm-hmm. and they spell better, B-E-D-D-E-R. <laughs> or you can just get the mechanisms and build your own bed. There's a company called Create a Bed, and they have all the accessories. You can build your own custom wall bed and build this into a partition wall, and they're at wallbed.com. How many minutes are we into this podcast? I don't know, maybe seven. Are we going to talk about building a partition wall? <laughs> so for a standard non-load-bearing wall, you're going to run a 2x4 all along the top of the wall and a 2x4 on the bottom. You're going to be spacing 2x4 studs vertically between them, except for the doorway area. And it's easy to run a top 2x4, and they call this the top plate, if your ceiling joists are running perpendicular to your top plate. And you're going to use a stud finder to mark the location of your joists in the ceiling. If your wall is running parallel, you're going to have to move the location so that top plate can be nailed directly into a joist, or you're going to have to put blocking between the joists so you have something to nail that top plate into. Okay. If you're building partition walls in new construction, generally you're going to build the wall flat on the ground and then lift it into place. But for most homes, it's going to be easier to install the top and the bottom plate and then cut each vertical stud to size. Many older homes are going to have some variance from one side of the room to the other, so it's smart to measure each stud. Mm -hmm. And I would lay out the plan on paper first to calculate where the door is going to go and how you're going to space your studs to make it easier to cut and hang your drywall. Studs 16 inches on center is the most common spacing, but for some short or partial walls, people will use 19.2 or 24 inch spacing, but 16 inches on center is going to be stronger. Why would you do it any different? I wouldn't. 16 inches on center. (laughs) When you're laying out your plan, start on one side with a 2x4 against the wall, and that will be your first stud. The second stud for the stud against the wall will have a 13 and 3 quarter inch space between the studs, or measure from the wall out 16 inches on that bottom plate and mark it, and that's going to be the center of your second stud, and now you're going to space each stud 16 inches from the center of the last stud, or you're going to have a space of 14 and a half inches between studs. And now this is going to allow you to lay your drywall against this. And you can re- lay your drywall vertically or horizontally. You're going to generally use four by eight sheets of drywall. And that 16 inch stud spacing lets you end each sheet in the middle of a stud. So the drywall How many times have you said stud? <laughs> So the drywall is securely fastened, and you end the wall with a 2x4 stud against the opposite wall. And that last spacing may be shorter or longer, and you're going to have to adjust it there. Your doorway opening will have two 2x4s side-by-side nailed together with 10-penny nails, so you're going to have a thickness of 3 inches. You want your drywall to be flush with the rough opening, so you're going to adjust your spacing on the plan, And on the breast of the wall, you want the beveled edges of the drywall to end in the center of the studs. Let's say you're laying them four foot wide and eight foot tall. I actually don't mind if a cut edge is at the rough opening of the door, and that way the door trim lays flat on it rather than into that bevel. So decide the opening size for your door. A pre-hung interior door is easy to hang, and you're going to get a very professional look. 
A common door size is 30 inches by 80 inches, and most have a rough opening of 32 by 82 and a half, or that's what they want you to have for your rough opening. So you want to build that into your plan. To be ADA compliant, you need a 36 inch wide door. And then look at the jam size. If you have a two by four wall, you're looking for a jam of four and five eighths or four and nine sixteenths. So two by four is three and a half inches. Uh, half inch drywall on each side as an inch so you're going to be at four and a half inches and look at the pre-hung doors and all their specs for the rough openings that way you're when you lay out your plan you're building it exactly to the door you're going to be putting in there a 32 by 80 door a couple of them i looked at wanted a rough opening 34 by 82 and a half a 36 by 80 inch door they wanted 38 by 82 and a half and then you're going to put double studs on the rough opening on top and on the sides, and that's going to give you the strength. So when you're you know, slamming the door, opening it, it's going to be a strong opening. Wow, this has been a lot of numbers. Do you think anybody's going to want to listen to this? <laughs> Just email me, <laughs> fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Let's say you have a 30 by 80 inch door that requires a 32 by 82 and a half inch opening. You're going to plan on one side a stud from the bottom plate to the top plate, and this is called a king stud. You're going to nail it to a jack stud that's going to be the height of the opening. So for this example, it's going to be 82 and a half inches high. On the other side, you're going to have a reverse layout. So you're going to have your jack stud and then a king stud next to it. Then you're going to nail two 2x4s on top to form your header, and this is going to stiffen up your opening. You're going to cut short pieces of 2x4 called cripple studs to fit above the header, usually one above each jack stud, and then one in the center for a normal doorway. If you have wider doors, you would add another cripple stud or two. And now you're going to plan for the opposite side of the doorway, spacing your studs 16 inches apart for your drywall. And then you're going to end with a slightly larger or smaller space and one stud against the opposite wall. Just Google a diagram of this. Yeah, if you look at a, di <laughs> <laughs> if you look at a diagram online, it'll all make sense. And, and it's, it's actually a really easy project. And it sounds it, like it. <laughs> yeah, once you look at it, it you'll, you'll understand everything I said. Once you have your plan and your lumber, lay out the top plate and nail it up. Use a plumb bob or a laser level to mark the location of your bottom plate so it's perfectly lined up. One technique is to use a full length of 2x4 on the floor and nail it in place. Or you'll use floor anchors if you're putting it into concrete. Put up all your studs and then cut out the section for the door. And you wouldn't want any nails or glue in that area if you're nailing or gluing your bottom plate down. Or you can cut the bottom <laughs> plate. Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes you forget. <laughs> and then you put that on your plan. Or you can cut the bottom plate in two sections, and that's how I always did it. Once your top plate and your bottom plates are in place, I would put my two end studs in, toenail them in place on the top and the bottom, and then put all the other studs in place. What is toenailing? It's driving nails at an angle, usually a 30 to 45 degree angle. For studs in a non-load-bearing wall, you can use two 16-penny sinker or common nails on the top and bottom, or three 16-penny sinker or box nails, and you can check with your local codes. When I was trained by a builder, he used two 16-penny nails on the top and the bottom of the studs, and he used a framer's hammer, and it just took him a couple swings on each nail to drive him home. It was pretty amazing. He taught me to use two sinker nails on one side of the stud, about an inch in on the sides, and one inch up from the bottom of the stud. For example, let's say we're putting in the bottom of the stud. You would hold the stud about a quarter inch back from your mark on the bottom plate. And I like wearing safety toe boots just in case. You're going to pound down at an angle 30 to 45 degrees, and when the stud moves to the line on your bottom plate and the nails have grabbed that bottom plate, now you can put a nail on the other side of the stud in the center of those two and drive it in, then finish them all off. So he taught me to use three nails. When he was putting in studs, he'd use common nails and only use two on the top and two on the bottom. And he would nail one side offset and then a second nail on the opposite side. And it was just fun to watch a pro. He would just get them in so fast. <laughs> he had a Polish crew, so I learned a lot of the hardware words in Polish. So like, words too. like, oh man, I learned all the curse words. But <laughs> Mwatek for hammer, noosh for knife, 
and Devnya for wood. And I'm sure. Do you think that's what that means? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, if, so, so if someone wants to email me and let me know if they really taught me uh-huh. the, some of the hardware words or not. When he was teaching me to frame these partition walls, he only used 16 penny and 10 penny nails and a hammer. It's pretty easy. If you have a nail gun, it's going to be much easier, especially <laughs> nailing the studs into that top plate. And you can create a 14 and a half inch spacer with a two by four to hold those studs in place if it's hard to keep the stud on its mark. And then you can move that from stud to stud. Except the first one and the last one. Right. You shouldn't need blocking between the studs for most projects unless it's a very long or tall wall. What's blocking? So it's two by fours cut to fit between the studs running horizontally in the center. And this is gonna stiffen up the wall. If you plan on adding wainscoting or chair rail, adding blocking is going to give you more area to connect to. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're building a wall and you're going to be anchoring fixtures or shelves, blocking is going to give you extra holding power. So you can plan where you want the blocking, take measurements and pictures, or, you know, create a plan so you know where it's all at. If you build a wall that's two feet or longer in length, you should check your local code requirements for outlets. Why? An outlet is generally required within six foot of an opening and six feet from any spot on the wall. So so usually you want them 12 feet apart. You could also add insulation between the studs to help with soundproofing or look at some of the soundproofing systems and then hang your drywall and compound all your seams. And you should listen to our past episodes about drywall. Yeah, the drywall tape and patches episode actually has some pretty good tips and our drywall and drywall repair episode has some tips too. You know, I saw an interesting drywall knife. It has a holder for a carpenter's pencil. It's from Dano Tools. It's D-A-N-O-Tools. So it's a fixed blade utility knife, and there's a slot for your carpenter's pencil. Exciting. Yeah, I love the inventors. (laughs) If you want to add some interest to your doorways, you can create an arch doorway. So you can make a template on a piece of cardboard or thin plywood for your drywall, and you can use a string and a pencil or a tape measure hooked to a screw head and use a pencil to make an arc. And there's a lot of steps you can follow online, but some of them are kind of complicated. (laughs) So now there's a lot of these prefabricated arch kits that you can get at lumber yards and home centers. Mm -hmm. And you just remove 12 inches or so of the old drywall from the top and the side of the opening. So you're removing half an inch of the drywall. You're going to screw in the arch, and then you're covering the front and the back with drywall, and then you're cutting drywall for the actual arched piece. What you're going to do is you're going to spray the back of it to wet it down, and then you're going to push it into place, and you're going to curve the drywall in there. Yeah, it looks nice. Yeah, pretty amazing. Online, there's a couple of kits. One is archkit.com, so it's A-R-C-H-K-I-T.com. And then there's another site, archwaysandceilings.com, and and is spelled out. And you would use a flexible plastic corner bead to finish off the drywall. There's a couple of top-rated companies. One is from Straight Flex. It's S-T-R-A-I-T, capital F-L-E-X. And they have something called Arch Flex. Mm -hmm. Gibraltar Building Products has vinyl arch drywall corners and Phillips has something, so it's P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. They have something called Grip Stick, and stick is spelled S-T-I-K, and it's arched corner bead, and it really finishes it off really nice. Okay. Do you have anything else to add? Building a partition wall is a great do-it-yourself project. You can make a big impact, and it just takes basic skills and some basic tools. What kind of tools? So, So really just a hammer, a speed square, a stud finder, a tape measure, a plumb bob, utility knife, and a pencil. And then you're going to have to cut your lumber, so circular saw or a miter saw. Or you could even do this with a handsaw. In fact, you could do this whole project without electric if you really (laughs) wanted to. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast now on the Pandora mobile app, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Player FM, or your favorite podcast app.
If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know on Amazon, book one through five, soon, book six. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com, and you can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Do you be